All right, thank you everyone that is currently here and uh, to anyone who may be watching this at a later date. This is a small webinar over native plants of Central Texas, as well as a little bit of a crash course in some things about um, foliage in Texas. If Sophia would like to start us off, we can. All right, this is the USDA Plant Hardiness Zone Map. So for those who aren't familiar, the USDA stands for the United States Department of Agriculture. This map is a standard by which gardeners and growers can determine which plants are most likely to thrive at any given location. So this map is broken up into a lot of colors, as you can obviously see. These are divided into 10 degrees Fahrenheit zones based on the minimum temperature during the winter in each. Um, so Georgetown, Texas falls in this little yellow gold bracket, zone 8B. And if you're interested, there is an interactive website. You can in enter your zip code and it will tell you which zone you belong to. And I can go ahead and drop that link later in the um, comment box if you guys are interested. All right, so just a brief overview of the Central Texas ecoregions. So uh, Texas has the largest number of ecoregions of any state because we're so big and we have just so many different um, ecosystems. So in Central Texas, we have Buckland Prairie, which is this purple region here. That's about half of Williamson County. Um, we have Post Oak Savanna to the east, which is this kind of rust pinkish color. Uh, the Edwards Plateau is to the west with this large blue area. Um, and the cross timbers is this yellow region up to the north. And then the, at the very bottom, this orangish color is Southern Texas Plains. We don't have a whole lot of that region. Um, there's a huge variety of plant and animal species in this region um, because Central Texas is kind of at like a crossroads of all these different ecosystems. Um, and Southwestern is right where that red arrow is. So we are kind of at the crossroads of the crossroads, if you will. Um, there, I won't go into too much detail about each ecoregion because there's just so much information, but um, the Blackland Prairies right here, the purple again, um, is some of the richest soils in the world. Um, a lot of the natural ecosystem has been um, adapted for farming because of the rich soils, uh, but there's still a lot of interesting um, wildlife going on, and especially with plants. So. All right, and here's a brief crash course in plant ID. Um, so, um, so for angiosperms, which are flowering plants, uh, one good way to identify them is through their inflorescence, which is just the, the grouping of their flowers or how their flowers are arranged on a stem. So um, if you ever come across a, a plant that has flowers and you don't recognize it, one good way to try to ID it is to look at the floral arrangement and try to match it against some of the common inflorescences on a chart like this. So um, for example, the compound umbel here in the middle to the right, um, that would be the fluorescence of Queen Anne's lace, which is that kind of um, like puff, powder puffy white flower that they, um, that looks like a top of a carrot. Uh, and this one up here called the head, that looks, that's what a sunflower looks like with all those tiny flowers in the center of the, um, of the flower head and then the ray flowers that are the uh, yellow petals. Uh, and then the cat hands down at the bottom left corner. Those are your traditional kind of tree flowers for like pecans and um, oaks and things like that. So, and next, if you can't identify something from the flowers, leaves are the next best thing. So there's a bunch of different leaf shapes um, and the margins or the edges of leaves can also give you hints as to what plant you're looking at, as can the base and how it attaches to the stalk. So for example, um, oak leaves look a lot like these oblanceolate ones here, um, five over from the left, with the, where the tip is a lot wider than the base. Um, and um, like the burr oak leaves, I believe there's like the, the trees on campus with the giant acorns that you trip over. Um, I believe their leaves are serrate, like this kind of rough edge one here. So again, if you're not sure what you're looking at, look at the leaves and try to compare it to some of the known examples. And then one more thing for leaves, um, how they're arranged on the stem can be a big hint out to what you're looking at. So they can be alternate, like going 
alternate sides up along the stem. They can be like mirrored on opposite sides of the stem or whirled like this. So like this rosette here, um, that's what you would typically see for a dandelion where all the leaves are at the base in kind of one plane. Um, leaves can be compound also. So uh, for example, a mimosa tree has these bipinnately compound leaves where they have a bunch of little leaves along um, a stem that's branching off from a main stem. And then there's the habit of leaves. So they can be kind of ascending sideways or straight up like a sunflower, sprawling like a, um, oh gosh, <laughs> hard to think of examples. Um, or they can be climbing like a vine or creeping along the ground, like um, some of your traditional ground cover plants. So taking all of these things like the inflorescence, the leaf shape, leaf arrangement, and the growth habit together will really help you identify what you're looking at. So we have a lot of different native Texas pollinators, and a lot of them are specialized to the types of flowers that they like the most. Um, of course, these are just some notable species for each of these different pollinators. They are far from the only species of each type of pollinator in Texas. Um, and to start off with, we have a very iconic butterfly. In fact, it is the state butterfly, the monarch. Um, which is down in the bottom right over there. Monarch butterflies, as you all probably know, really love milkweed, which we'll be discussing a little bit later. Another pollinator is the beetles, which don't get nearly as much attention as something like butterflies or hummingbirds. But beetles are actually um, very important pollinators, and the flowers that have adapted for that they like the most are some of the oldest flowers um, currently known. And uh, as a representative beetle species would be the longhorn beetle, which is a fairly common native Texas species. And talking about bees, honeybees kind of are the star of the show, but 90% of te native Texas bees are solitary, not colony bees, and honeybees are not native to Texas. Pictured in the top right is the mason bee, which is one such solitary bee. And talking about moths, moths do also don't get enough uh, attention. They are outshined heavily by butterflies since we don't get to see them as much. But there are some very important, um, moths are very important pollinators and there are some very pretty moths such as the black witch moth, another native Texas species. Another uh, pollinator that gets a bit of a bad rep and is a creature of the night would be our bat species in Texas, which are important for uh, an array of different native species, including um, most agave plants. The Mexican free-tailed bat is one such species. Finally, in talking about hummingbirds, um, hummingbirds flowers are typically the longer tubular kind of shaped flowers. Um, because those are the ones that uh, hummingbirds have adapted their beak into being able to drink the, the nectar from. One very iconic hummingbird species is the broad-tailed hummingbird. All right, well now that we've kind of gone over some general information about Texas or Central Texas specifically and pollinators, um, we're gonna just give a brief overview of some um, kind of iconic Central Texas plants. A lot of them are flowers because people like flowers and they're easier to, to identify. Um, so starting off, we have the common evening primrose or um, Inothera biennis. And so this is a kind of um, a plant that enjoys wet soils growing along like the edges of lakes and streams. They bloom from late spring to late summer. Um, their seeds are a very important food for birds and they are a larval host for the primrose moth and the white line that sphinx moth. Um, and all parts of the plant are edible, um, including stem, leaves, uh, flowers, though you want to um, kind of time when you would harvest them depending on um, how bitter you want your salad to taste. Um, and primrose oil is thought to improve many medical conditions, including eczema and PMS, um, though it's kind of question whether it's actually effective or how much of it is kind of folklore and placebo. Um, but some people will swear by it. So, you know, the placebo effect is real. And then on this next slide, we have another primrose species. Um, this is Inothera in um, speciosa, which is the showy evening primrose. And I just, I really like these because they're so pretty. Um, and you can see them growing along the roadsides pretty much everywhere. Um, and they are also hosts for some moth species. 
Okay, so the next vibrant flower I'm going to talk to, about is the Indian paintbrush. Uh, this one is very common, and if you've ever been in the hill country around springtime or in the summer, then I'm sure you've seen it before. So these plants are annual or biannual. Uh, they're kind of unpredictable in their nature. Some years uh, there will be a whole swath of them. Other times, other parts of the year, you might only get a patch or two. They are typically found alongside highways, um, alongside uh, the brilliant blue bonnets. So the flowers are actually red-tipped bracts. The true flowers themselves are these tiny inconspicuous green and yellow blooms, but the red flowers that you see aren't true flowers. Uh, so this plant is parasitic as well. Its root systems will extend into the soil and suck nutrients from other plants in the surrounding area. It thrives in sandy and clay soils and it is a big pollinator plant for many species of butterflies. There's this legend of the Indian paintbrush. Um, it's one of my favorite from my childhood by Tommy DePaolo. I'm not going to explain it to you, but if you're interested in reading it, I highly recommend it. It's a beautiful tale. Here we have the butterfly milkweed, which is a species of milkweed that is close to my heart because we had a, quite a bit of it growing in my backyard growing up. Um, the butterfly milkweed is unique among milkweed because it does not have the milk-like sap that is in most milkweeds in which, for which it is named. Um, it is a perennial plant. Um, they are noted by having long stalks um, and many different ones that are bunched up from the ground, although younger ones have a bit of a different structure until they can get themselves established. It grows well in acidic, dry soil, which is why it works very well in Texas. It blooms in the midsummer and then sometimes again in the late summer. And they attract many types of bees, hummingbirds, and then of course the most famously uh, the monarch butterfly. And the monarch butterfly is a part of um, a group of butterflies called milkweed butterflies because they rely exclusively on milkweed as their source of food and the place to lay their young, which is why uh, milkweed is such an important native plant. All right, and moving on from milkweed, which is really pretty and I love it. Um, we have arrowhead, or uh, also called duck root, also called vapado. Um, and there are also many other names, but I can only put three here. Um, you know, if you ever really get into plants, you'll find that there are a bajillion common names for everything, and it get really, gets really confusing. Um, so the Latin name, which is Sagittaria latifolia, and the Sagittaria comes from the shape of the leaves because they look like arrows, and if you know your constellations, Sagittarius is the archer. So, um, and if you are a fan of the Hunger Games, you might recognize this plant as one of the Katniss plants that they reference, um, and the, the leaf shape arrows are referenced to, to Katniss and her, her, her archery skills. So, um, Wapato grows, blooms in late spring to late summer. It's found throughout the United States and Canada. Uh, it's less common in central Texas, but it will grow in aquatic areas, in wet soils, so on rivers and lakes and streams streams. Um, it's called duck root because it has very edible roots, though um, ducks don't usually eat them actually. Um, it's more beavers and porcupines and muskrats um, and humans. Um, they were a, a staple for uh, many Native American groups that lived throughout the United States. Um, and their tubers taste a lot like potatoes if you eat them. Um, that's why they're called, another common name is duck potato. Um, and one, um, they're actually part of the water plantain family, which is a, a broad family of aquatic plants where their leaves will grow either partially submerged or completely submerged under, under the water. Okay, so the next plant is the Texas mountain laurel. This is one of my personal favorites. Um, if you live on campus, then I'm sure you've seen these trees bloom and probably seen the pods as well. I actually have some of these trees in my home back in Houston, Texas. So they are part of the evergreen ornamental tree family, um, and sorry, part of the pea family. And if you look at the flower, they're very closely reminiscent to pea flowers. If you've ever grown those in your garden, you might recognize that. They are a multi-trunked shrub or tree. They can grow up to be about 30 feet tall, although typically they're between 10 to 15 feet tall. They are very drought resistant, sorry, drought tolerant, with a preference for rocky limestone soil, which is perfect because, as you guys probably know, Georgetown has a lot of limestone. 
They have a very distinct aroma. So I'm sure if you've smelled it before, many people will say it's very similar to grape flavored products such as grape Kool-Aid. Uh, typically blooms in the spring and the fruit is a semi woody pod with these bright red poisonous seeds. I've been told that apparently sometimes if someone ingests it, it's partially hallucinogenic, although please do not try these, disclaimer. Continuing my little theme of uh, unusual plant species um, that are not like the other groups, uh, the others in their group is the Texas Red Yucca, which is not actually a yucca. Um, it's a perennial evergreen shrub, and it's actually part of the lily family. Um, something that helps define the difference there has to do with each of the individual leaves um, and the fact that they do not have um, kind of spine-like thing on the edge of the individual leaves. And instead, there's a fiber there that can be used in cordage. And uh, many Native American groups have used um, those leaves for uh, creating cordage in the past. Um, it is a full sun plant that is very drought resistant and heat resistant, um, although it doesn't mind um, being watered too much either. Really, it's just a very, very hardy plant. It's a favorite for hummingbirds. It's native to central and western Texas, and it can handle both clay and sandy soils. You might recognize um, red yucca from being uh, in the, um, I don't remember the term for it, but it's the strip of land, yeah, uh, between, um, between highways or roads because it's easy to just plant them and they'll figure it out, they'll, they'll grow just fine. Yeah, Texas is actually pretty good about planting natives in along highways and in medians and things like that, which is really smart because you, they're adapted to the landscape and you don't really need to take care of them. Uh, so moving on from the, the yucca, that's not a yucca, um, we have sensitive briar, um, also known as sensitive plant or shame plant, um, again, many common names. Um, so it's Mimosa rom romia, oh my gosh, Romariana. Um, and the mimosa comes from the Greek word mimos, meaning actor or mime, and then the suffix osa means resembling. So they resemble mimes. And they're named that because if you touch the leaves, very quickly they will close up like this, like, um, um, uh, oh my gosh, fly traps. Uh, what are those called? The carnivorous plants um, that eat flies. Um, and that is actually a factor of trigger pressure. So whenever you, you touch a leaf, um, those, um, the base cells will swell with water and it will force them closed. And that is an adaptation to scare away anything that was trying to eat the plant. That's not actually going to do any harm to an insect or a predator because it's literally just the leaves closing. Um, but they do have some gnarly stems that have covered in thorns like blackberries. So you don't want to get your feet caught in them. Um, they're found primarily in north central Texas and on the Edwards Plateau because they like dry uh, sandy soils. Um, I took this picture in the Passes, Texas, which is about an hour north of Georgetown. Um, and they are host to butterflies and moths of both the Pieridae and the Galactosidae families. Um, and the, the Pieridae family includes uh, sulfur butterflies, which are those uh, little yellow butterflies that we see very commonly flitting around. Um, and interestingly, these uh, flowers are actually big clusters of little tiny flowers. Um, so kind of like a sunflower in that way. Um, so there's maybe 20 or 30 little flowers with 10 stamens each. And all of those stamens together make up this little puffball. Okay, and the last plant I'm gonna talk about is the prickly pear cactus. Um, so these are small to medium ground hugging species. If you're in the Georgetown, Central Texas area, I'm sure by now you've probably seen them on a hike or two. Um, the pads grow out in all directions, so they just kind of spread out like this. There are two types of spines, the visible ones that you can see these long, longer needle-like spines, and then the invisible ones, which are called glochids. And they're more, I guess you could, akin to hair-like spines, little, little prickles almost. Um, and so this plant is really important for bees and lesser known long-nosed bats. These 
two um, species pollinate this plant the most. Uh, the lesser known bat, lesser known long nosed bat, is perfectly adapted for the flowers because they are kind of set deep. And so the bat is able to stick its nose down to the core. Uh, the, both the cactus pad and the fruit are edible. They are known in Spanish as tunas and nopales. So the red, um, almost maroon fruit is a tuna and the cactus pad, once cooked properly, is called nopales. All right, now we have a tree over here, the state tree. Uh, which is the Texas native pecan tree. Um, the Texas native pecan is the largest tree species in both the hickory and walnut families. And while it's best known for pecan nuts, which I, I am confident that everyone here has had some sort of pecan pie, pralines, anything, um, but the wood is also used in furniture making. Um, it is the only commercially grown nut in Texas, and Texas is the second largest producer of pecans in the U.S. We are outshined by Georgia, unfortunately. All right, and our final plant species would be perhaps the most iconic one in Texas, though if you're like me and you like the little inconspicuous weeds, you get mad at the ones that are all showy. But um, so we have the blue bonnet. Um, this species here is Lupinus texanus, which is the, the biggest and most um, vibrant of the species in Texas. Though there are t technically five blue bonnet species that are considered the state flower of Texas because when they did the legislation in 1901, um, they weren't really thinking about the specifics of there being multiple blue bonnets in Texas. So instead of trying to hash that out they were just like okay if it's a if it looks like a blue bonnet it's close enough um, but of those there are only two species that are actually endemic to texas so they're only found here and that is lupinus texanus and uh, lupinus subcarnosus um, and the subcarnosus um, blue bonnets are a little ganglier and not quite as lush as the lupinus texanus ones um, so most of the blue bonnets in texas are annuals so for one species in the northeast um, they are an important source of nectar for native bees, including the mason bees that we discussed at the beginning. Um, and they're also central to Texas folklore, just like the Indian paintbrush. Um, they have their own legend around how they became to this area. Um, and they're just pretty, you know, despite all the <laughs> kind of cliched shots of families like sitting in blue bonnet fields and then um, assumed, assumedly getting stung by bees. Um, th they are a really nice plant too. Uh, sh to showcase our state. And there are also legumes um, like the Texas mountain laurel. You can see the, the characteristic hull shape of the flower here. Um, and any plant that is a legume will fix nitrogen using its, um, through its roots and its bacteria. So they're beneficial to the, the plant, the ground where they're grown. All right, so now we have a Q and A with our Lance Robertson. Robertson, um, who is uh, the greenhouse tech um, and certified arborist and um, an invaluable part of the uh, unofficial but invaluable part of the grounds team since uh, Lance has been helping us out with so many projects with his vast plant knowledge. So if you have any plant related questions, um, you can drop them in the chat. Additionally, if you have any questions about getting involved with plants on campus, Sophia and Leah had the uh, gardening club. And so if you have any questions for them, feel free to shoot them in uh, the Q&A. Also, if you have any questions about any of the plants that we've covered, feel free to stick them in the Q&A. All right, so to start off our little discussion here, um, as people decide if they have any questions to ask, um, we have a few questions. So Lance, would you mind giving us a bit of a crash course in what are the, some of the most obvious benefits uh, to growing native plants as opposed to non-native plants? I think you're muted, Lance, or it doesn't look like you're muted, but we can't hear you. Or is that just me? Can you hear me now? Yes. Wonderful. So one of the best things about native plants is 
they grow here and we know they grow here because they grew here before we got here that's typically a my line the delineation of what's native and what's not is what was here when people first arrived so trying to have plants grow that we know grow here on their own is the absolute most obvious thing for me why would we put in uh, more effort more time more um, resources to making our world beautiful when it's pretty beautiful on its own. I, I can't tell how tell you how many times somebody has said, I want my landscape to look beautiful like nature. And I say, drive out to nature and go look at what plants those are and tell me which ones you like, because those are the ones uh, that you should be planting if you want to do the least and have the most. Uh, so it's really important to me. Um, but I kind of like to go over some of the, the points that you talked about. One is the eco regions. Texas does have so many eco regions. Just because it is native to Texas does not mean it's going to grow in your part of Texas, right? I cannot say how many times I've had people call me and say, I have a bald cypress in uh, central Texas and it's not doing well. Well, bald cypress like to be in several feet of water. Uh, they grow very well. Part of Texas is under several feet of water most of the year, down near Orange, down near Houston. Uh, we have so many different ecoregions that just because it's native to Texas doesn't mean it's native to your part of Texas. Uh, Hesperole, the uh, red yuccas that we showed you, if you plant those in a lot of areas of Texas, they're going to rot from fungus. Um, it's just a problem that they have whenever it's too wet and especially our far eastern side of Texas is much wetter than our far western side of Texas. Uh, so knowing what goes, but that's the reason why we all see so many flowers. Most of Texas's wildflowers grow absolutely everywhere in Texas. Um, and the great thing about them is they all evolved in an area like the Blackland Prairies where periodically they get set on fire. Uh, animals would come and graze through them. All of the common problems that we see today, hordes of bugs, crickets, uh, beetles, things have, have made it to where they grow very well, they work with the uh, environment and can do very well with very little work. Um, but at the same time, I like to remind people native plants are also something that um, if you don't have any bugs eating your plants in, in your landscape, you're probably not part of the environment. And that should be part of your, your process of planting plants and of growing things is you want things that attract the bugs because not all bugs are bad. Some bugs are good. They all are terrifying to me. I'm, I love plants. Bugs are, bugs are scary sometimes to me, but they're, they're good. They pollinate, they give me food. Um, they give us all food, well, something like 75% of the world's food couldn't happen with some form of bee, right? Whether it be solitary or uh, colony bees, they're incredibly important. So having them in your backyard is, is, is a good thing. We need to keep the bees around so that we can all eat. So um, to me, native plants, they, they just make sense. So that's my little spiel on, on that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, another thing is that whenever we were doing our research, um, a lot of us noticed that many variants of uh, the species that we thought of as native aren't native to Texas. For instance, um, the Texas red yucca is uh, native to Texas, but there are many other colors of yucca which aren't, but you still see in Texas. Um, this is the same thing with the primrose and um, many species of Indian paintbrush aren't native. Um, in your opinion, why do you think that many native plants aren't grown and sold commercially? Um, it is faults of organizations from which I've been a part of, certainly in the past, that when it's too easy, we can't sell it to you because what happens when we give you one blue bonnet this year and next year you have five blue bonnets because they reseed and the following year you have 12 and then the following year you have a little field. I can't sell you anything next year if I work at a nursery. So that's truly been one of the largest problems is nurseries are businesses to people. And it's very hard for us to convince uh, businesses to tell people to do something that is going to use less resources, that's going to give you less customers. Um, but slowly but surely, many organizations like mine have decided that this makes sense from a real world standpoint. And there are still ways that we can um, propagate seeds. We can come up with new varieties. Uh, we can do things that are um, much more sustainable, that are good not only for us, but also for the end users. So that's truly in the past been one of the larger problems. Um, the other thing is, is 
once it's grown and recognized, it's hard to say no. Uh, most people, when you say primrose, you're talking about these perfect little flowers that grow. They sell them in every nursery. Uh, those are not our native primrose. So whenever you show them the true native primrose, sometimes they say, ooh, that doesn't look like the one that I've got or that I like in my head. And you say, Texas primrose. Uh, so it's, some of it is just patterns that we need to break. More, more people like the, the three of y'all that see these native plants and say, that's a primrose, that's the same plant. Uh, one of my favorite uh, realizations about these native flowers and how they move around is, uh, I went to Iceland once and there's a variety of lupine in Iceland that is an invasive species. The uh, locals hate it, it is taking over and I thought it was amazing to go in the middle of June and see basically what I thought were blue bonnets all over Iceland. Uh, when at the same time, every time I would say, look at that great field, they'd say, we hate those, how do we get rid of them? Uh, and I would say, I have no experience in that. Those are good plants to us, so we try to encourage them. Uh, and uh, we've just found out that lupine is one of those ones that can survive anywhere. So again, native plants can sometimes move and sometimes be easier. Uh, and sometimes just over time, we bred them to look slightly different. So when people get used to something they, they don't like the you know, scraggly that may be usual, because again, uh, go out into the woods and it looks much worse in July than it will in uh, November. But that's because that's, that's how our environment goes. So. So um, say I wanted to get some native primroses for my yard um, and I couldn't buy them from a nursery. Is that something I could gather from the wild and transplant or what are, what are the issues surrounding that? Um, first and foremost, uh, certainly do not do that in any sort of a wildlife area. Don't do it in state parks and public park areas. Don't do it on land that you don't own or you don't know the owner because there are some of the plants that we know only exist now in state parks. Uh, because we have these different ecoregions, because we have so many splits and uh, urban sprawl has been brutal in some of these areas, uh, I don't suggest to, to do wild collection in anywhere that's not, again, somebody's home, somebody's private property, uh, and then ensuring that you're not taking 100% of the plant, that you're not taking uh, the plant itself, that you're just taking either propagated material like seeds or doing cuttings from them so that the existing stands can stay. We don't lose populations. We can just gain them in other landscape areas. Well, it looks like we've got a question from the Q&A. So, um, so this is from an anonymous person. So do you have recommendations for a shade tree that I could plant at the street curb that will shade the car but not drop messy stuff on it? Um, the messy stuff is really going to be part of a lot of trees. Um, you know, truly the reason why we often plant trees above is we want shade. Um, but the things that make the shade like leaves, they're not permanent. There's even, uh, obviously live oaks have pollen and people don't like the pollen. So that's a problem, but at least they keep most of their leaves most of the year. So if you're looking for shade, they're not terribly bad. And really there's only a three or four week window that you should have to avoid the pollen parking directly underneath them. Um, but there is pretty much something that falls out of every tree, whether it be acorns or flower petals, or if you're doing crepe myrtles, uh, you'll have bug fun. Um, so again, trying to get the environment closer and then also not want anything from the environment to touch all your materials is a uh, something that, would be better to see, but it doesn't always truly uh, work to our advantage, I guess is the way I'll say it. Speaking of pollen, as someone who suffers from allergies from everything, uh, there's the idea that um, native plants, exposure to native plants um, are still uh, as pollen detrimental will still spike people's allergies um, as badly as uh, non-native plants. Is there a difference in the amount of pollen that a native and non-native plant gives off? Not necessarily between native and non-native, but unfortunately for many allergy sufferers, especially here in Central Texas, one of our native trees is a juniper, uh, most commonly known as a cedar. 
and that um, distributes pollen by wind. So we've, we've talked about a lot of flowering plants. There's a lot of uh, conifers that are gymnosperms and many of them spread their seeds by literally blowing in the wind. Uh, they did not evolve with a bug or another organism to help transplant their genetic material. Uh, they use the wind. Uh, so there are a lot of native and non-native plants that it's simply just going to spread pollen. And if you're unfortunately allergic to their pollen, uh, it's not a good thing necessarily. But there are thousands of non-native plants that you not only wouldn't want to breathe their pollen, you wouldn't want to touch them, right? So to tell you that it's, it's solely native versus non-native is a little bit of a misnomer. I'm, I'm fortunate to where cedar doesn't bother me. So I, I can go to Cedar Breaks Park in the middle and be covered in the yellow and come out smiling. Whereas uh, I know people in Houston that I can call and say, hey, the wind is blowing and we see the pollen and they know they're gonna have allergies tomorrow um, because it's just that bad sometimes for folks. So um, I don't believe that there is a preference. Uh, to me, it's more the older the plant generally, the less animal friendly it tends to be. So again, many of our conifers get people problems. Um, but it, I don't want to steer you away from natives for that reason, because there are tons of them that you've never heard of. There are something like 5,500 plants that are endemic to Texas. And I've never heard of an allergy from like 4,500 of those and 500 of the allergy claims I'd uh, we're never medically verified. So I think there's a lot of native plants that uh, if you are an allergy sufferer, certainly they wouldn't cause any effect. Could you maybe explain um, a bit of the difference between the terms natural landscaping, native landscaping, and beneficial landscaping? So Natural landscaping, when I, I've used the term in the past, is more about the maintenance programs. It's not necessarily all native plants. You may use something like hollies or boxwoods or privets or ligustrum, something that's not necessarily from your area, um, but something that is well adapted that takes very little extra resources. These are commonly ones that we would see that um, don't have irrigation in the landscape uh, that might even use plants that some of us might consider invasive. Um, but because they are trapped in a landscape environment, they're not really getting away. Again, something like ligustrum is not really going to spread terribly if you're not on a creek or if you're not in water, um, not in a way that's going to get invasive. Uh, whereas true native landscapes are just trying to use the plants that are here. Very often to me, these are, you find local or common plants that are already growing there and you basically influence those to grow out and slowly but surely rid yourself of the non-native plants that are going to be coming in and out through your landscape. And then beneficial landscape is often ones where you are using some resources. You're, you can plant some native plants, but you would also be adding plants for pollinators, adding plants that you would be eating that, uh, that may take some extra resources, but you get the benefit of it because you're getting nutrient to some generally other animal, but sometimes other plants where uh, you know, you may grow lots of legumes, like she was saying earlier, the nitrate fixers. You may grow a mesquite tree on your property solely to make fertilizer for the rest of your plants. Uh, it produces enough nitrogen where uh, you can grind the material and use it as a native fertilizer. Um, so these would be beneficial where you may use a few more resources than a truly native landscape or a non-irrigated landscape, um, but you get some added benefit from it and save a resource somewhere. Do you have any like go-to tips for establishing um, like a native plant garden or lawn? I know it changes depending on where you are, especially in Texas, um, but is there anything that kind of broad advice you would give? The thing that I always suggest to people is find what's growing there now, or go find the closest empty lot, go find the closest truly non-maintained location and find out what's there. Uh, very frequently, especially when uh, people have large areas of turf. You'll find there's many annuals that'll come up in the turf. We think they're weeds, but find out later, oh, that's a version of portulaca. Uh, some people call it moss rose. I should take that out of my grass and put it into my bed. Um, stuff like this, using the trees that are naturally growing. If you get a volunteer plant, it may not be in the right place. And that's all that weeds are, a good plant in the wrong place. Just 
move it location. Um, that is certainly one thing that I, you will see me do very commonly is digging up some poor little plant in the side of the, the concrete and trying to put it into a bed because I know that it's going to grow there whether or not I do it. If it can survive the, the infant stages of planthood, uh, it can survive the adult stages in the same place. So uh, that's one of the, my favorite things to suggest to people is uh, find what your neighbors call weeds. If you like the look of them, many of them flower more than a lot of other plants. Put them in your beds and watch them spread. Well, awesome. Well, we have another attendee question. So we have flat stepping stone rocks in our patio, but grass grows between them and tries to take over the area. Treating it with vinegar slash dawn slash salt mixture only works temporarily. Are there seeds or ground covers we could put there as a good alternative? Yes. Um, first, I want to say, though, uh, the vinegar and oil is great. Don't put any more salt. Salt is very, very bad in general for most plants long term. So oil and vinegar is great, but I would not put too many salt mixtures in there or uh, much like Carthage, uh, they salted the earth back in the 1200s and there are still areas where plants cannot grow. Um, putting salt in mixtures be can become very difficult if you're not doing it in a very precise manner. Yes, there are nitrates are salt. There are some chemistry questions that go bound, but in general, uh, especially when making home stuff, no salts in your thing. Um, but as far as native plants, my absolute favorite native plant in between stepping stones is called Phyla nodiflora. Uh, most people call it frog fruit. It is becoming more commercially available. It's got a little white flower. It grows very low. There are some varieties that will grow a little bit taller. So if your stepping stones are three or four inches tall, you can do that. Um, but it also takes an absolute walking beating. Um, right now, I'm going toward the greenhouse. There's a couple of parking spots, and right along the edge of those parking spots, you will see we have a whole bunch of phyllanodiflora growing right there. Uh, it gets stepped on every time I get out of the vehicle. Most of the times, anyone comes to the greenhouse, it gets walked on, and it does not. Uh, it doesn't die. It can crush. It can. You can walk on it. The flowers may disappear for a few days, um, but generally, it'll do its little spreading thing. Uh, and continue to grow. So it's something that I really like for between stepping stones. Um, and there are a lot of plants that will do it, but grasses are king. I, I hate to tell people that. If you've got an area, the first thing that you can do is just try to eliminate your grasses because they are super tough when it comes to walking on them and in between cracks. So uh, while I know it may not look great, if you've got grasses in between, sometimes it's hard to tell people maybe stick with the grasses. Um, P-H-Y-L-A, uh, phyla, is the, is the genus and the species is Nodiflora. Uh, I'm going to say N-O-D-I-F-L-O-R-A, but please Google me. My Latin spelling is awful. Uh, phyla, I'm pretty confident in. Nodiflora, I'm not. Um, there are tons of phyllas that are here. Nodiflora is my personal favorite. There are several phyllas that you can find. I know through my friend Jeff Bezos, uh, he's got them, or a couple of local nurseries also have plants available as well. So, to tie right into that question, actually, so how would someone deter pests or fungus without resorting to, say, invasive measures, which would damage the plants? Um, uh, sometimes people use uh, citron or, or citrus mixture with soap to kind of deter. But how, how do you keep away sure. pests and fungus? Sure. So I like to remind people I have every pesticide license this, this state can give you. I have them all. And most of the time in landscapes, you don't need to use any pesticide. And I'm including natural pesticides. I'm including anything. Just because you see a mushroom in your yard doesn't mean you have fungal problems and you must get rid of them. Um, mushrooms are absolutely needed in breaking down thatch and lawn uh, to give your lawn nutrients. Um, mulch will have to be broken down by a fungus. You may see things like that. So in general, my suggestion is don't attack anything that is not actually killing plants. If the plants are the part of your landscape that is having a problem with these bugs, right? Or uh, fungus or something like that. Again, 
if your if your yard doesn't have fungus, there's something going wrong. So you know, trying to always put something to get rid of every fungus may not be your best option. Sometimes the best option may be let the fungus run its course. It's very common even on campus. You'll see we uh, have a tree that falls or we have to cut a tree down. We leave part of the stump. There becomes a perfect circle of mushrooms around the stump because we've encouraged a type of fungus, a mushroom to grow. It slowly but surely grows out from the central trunk where most of the wood is. And then when it becomes fruiting, it's got this perfect little circular ring of mushrooms that come up. Many people call them fairy rings. It's just a natural process that happens whenever we have fungus eat trees. Um, so very commonly you'll see people do that. They'll go out, they'll put um, <clears throat> copper sulfate. It's a really common natural way to get rid of fungus. If you have a true fungus, it is hurting, say, roses. That's something great to put. But if you try to do that every year on your roses, you end up with a buildup of copper. That may be a problem. Really, if you let the plant overcome it some, and it's, you don't let it kill it, obviously, but you let it run, very often the plant will be able to fight off these larger fungal infections. They'll be able to um, have less issues in the future if they do have a small fungal infection. So um, while I'm not saying you'll never have a problem in your landscape, you don't need to cure, many of them um, can work themselves out. Uh, or let's say you have a fungal problem. Fungus has to have water. So certain times of year, if you see a fungus in July, it's because you're watering too much. My suggestion is not spray fungicide. My suggestion is for you to cut off your irrigation for a few days. Um, many times, uh, there's not something that you need to add to your problem. Sometimes it's things that you need to do less of to, to get the same result. So that's why I really like to work with some of these native plants. Every flower is not going to look good every year. It's just like we talked about with Indian paintbrush. Some years you drive up and down 130 the tollway or 35 somewhere in central Texas and there are paintbrush everywhere. You can't believe you would ever live anywhere else. And then there are some years where you're like, I found three flowers this year. This whole year I can only find three. What happened? Um, there's cycles. There's weather that's involved in germination. So having expectations of a native landscape is also really important. You don't want to have a vision of an English manicured garden and think I'm going to put in the effort of a native garden. So, uh, you know, kind of working all these ideas together is truly what we should start doing slightly more to, to kind of balance that, you know, aesthetic pleasure that we want from our landscape and then kind of incorporating it with some of these native, native plants. Absolutely. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join us. And before you head out, we have one last question we wanted to ask, and this kind of puts you on the spot. And I know you might've already said something about this, but what would be your, I guess, top native Texas plant and why? I mean, I would, I would be kicked out of the state if I didn't say blue bonnet. I mean, if, if, you, if you've been on in what, every social media platform from January to March. If you can't scroll for a day and find a blue bonnet field picture, then you don't live where I live. I mean, so that's, I've got to say blue bonnet. Well, perfect. I think that concludes our webinar. Um, again, if anyone has any further questions, we're still here for a few more minutes. Just drop them in the Q&A box. There's some... Oh, there's another question. So um, I recently downloaded the Seek app on my phone. Do you have any other recommendations for easily identifying plants while out on a hike? Well, I can partially answer this one. Um, sometimes of apps, um, iNaturalist is a great um, identification app. It's not an um, instant. You can't just like post a picture and you'll get an answer. Um, but there are hundreds of probably thousands of avid plant enthusiasts out there who will identify um, plant pictures for you, also insects, um, and pretty much anything that's that you find out on a hike. Um, so I naturally so definitely look at that. Um, also, if you like with 
fairly minimal work you can find most anything on Google. Um, I always try reverse image searching by putting um, a picture of the thing you're looking for onto Google Images and just looking for something that looks similar. Um, at Texas A&M also has a wide variety of um, plant glossaries on their websites, uh, especially for trees. And um, there's actually a book that I would recommend. Let me grab it real quick. If what you're looking at is a flower, this book, uh, Wildflowers of Texas by Gayata, um, I, just, I don't know how to say her last name actually, but um, this is like the Bible for Texas wildflowers. Um, so this is a great thing to have. Um, but if it's for like grasses or forbs or anything that's not flowering, um, just Google. Um, that's the best advice I can give. Do y'all have any other suggestions? I do not. I would also recommend iNaturalist, but like Leah said, I think the there are a few naturalist websites for both like plant and animal species, um, native Texas plants and wildlife. I can't think of the exact names or links to those, but there are so many special like naturalist websites in Texas dedicated to identifying native plants. So I guess any one of those, if you cross reference them with each other, you'll probably find which plant you're looking at. Yes, the other thing that I'll certainly suggest iNaturalist is good because you have a lot of people that will look at the same postings. Um, Sometimes it sounds weird, but Reddit is really good because they will make sure uh, if you're wrong, you know how wrong you are. Um, so they're good. I do um, tell people to be kind of careful on some of the Google image search because if I stick something on Pinterest and I'm wrong about that, but it's got a tag in the picture, you may get a name that is just what I made up. Uh, the other thing is uh, there are so many crazy common names that just because you call it goose grass, doesn't mean anybody else uh, outside of a very small group of people I've come to find out might call it goose, goose grass. Um, my favorite place to go if you're looking for them and you have some kind of description, as we talked about earlier, either leaf description or flower description is um, the Wildflower Center, wildflower.org. It is based in Austin down there. It is absolutely the best online catalog of native plants, not just in Texas, but in the whole US. Uh, they have hundreds of thousands of plants and every piece of information you could ever want about them. And most of them have pictures that you can search through to um, confirm whether or not it's what you thought you saw. All right, well, I think that might finish us out there. Um, thank you again, Lance, for taking the time out of your day to uh, join us on this webinar. And um, to anyone watching, I would, um, enthusiastically recommend every other webinar that the um, SU Ega reps have done. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for attending. Thank you so much for your questions and your attention. And um, go have some fun with plants sometime. <laughs> <laughs>